Welcome everyone. Just wanted to let you know you're in the right place with Operation Parent and Arlene Rice today. We're going to be talking about helping families navigate the system of addiction and understanding treatment options. We're going to take just a couple of minutes and let everybody come in from the queue. In the meantime, we're going to tell you about a couple of upcoming webinars um, here at Operation Parent that you're welcome to register for um, while you're waiting for the program to start. We have a rebroadcast hiding in plain sight on Wednesday, March the 3rd at 8 p.m. That's with Trooper Robert Purdy with the Kentucky State Police. And then on March the 8th, uh, we'll be covering adolescent mental health in 2020 and um, the anxiety that teens are facing and dealing with related um, to COVID. This is with Dr. Aaron Weiner. Operation Parents mission is to love and support parents by providing real world information, connection, and most importantly, hope. So right before I introduce Arlene, I'd like to take you through a couple of the technical components of the system so that you can participate with us today. Up at the top, um, if you wish to view your screen without the control panel, just click on that orange tab to minimize it at any time during the presentation. For now though, I'd like for you to click on that orange arrow and open up your control panel and view all the features with me. It might look a little different um, if you're on your phone, um, so just know that as you're listening to these instructions. Um, all attendees are gonna be muted during the presentation today. We would, however, love to hear from you via the question section. And those questions can start to come in um, at any point in time for Arlene. About, it's about halfway down the control panel. You're gonna send both questions and comments here. Please know that we may go just a bit over the 60 minute mark with the question and answer segment. So we understand if you're not able to stay for the entire presentation, but you will receive the recording following this event. For today's webinar, you are gonna find five handouts, excellent handouts. Um, the first three are from the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids at Drug-Free Org. Um, so we thank you for the amazing content that you're putting out there. Um, the first one is entitled Questions to Ask drug treatment programs. The second one is a treatment ebook about how to find the right help for your teen with an alcohol or drug problem. The third one is titled Your Child's Treatment Roadmap. And we understand um, that everyone's road to recovery is different. And so we wanted to introduce you to many resources and handouts um, today to, to help along, along the journey. The last handout is what to look for and what to avoid when searching for an addiction treatment program. And this is from another great organization, the Partnership to End Addiction. Just double click on any of those handouts to begin the download process. And just know, right prior to this webinar, we also sent you these handouts uh, via email. So you should have two locations um, that you could get to the handouts today. We are recording this presentation and the recording will be sent in a follow-up email 24 hours after the completion of this webinar. So please wait a full 24 hours and also maybe check your junk folders um, for that information. For our attendees today on the live version of this webinar, we have a certificate of attendance that will be attached to the follow-up email. This email, which contains, also contains the re recording link and the certificate of attendance, will be sent to you 24 hours after the completion of this webinar. So um, we also wanna let you know, there's a survey coming immediately following the close of the webinar. As many of you who have attended several webinars with us know, um, we utilize the any information and uh, feedback that you give us on that survey. We love 
that you also continue to give us support and encouragement and constructive feedback is always appreciated. All of it is all appreciated and utilized. Um, now it is my distinct pleasure to have the honor of introducing Arlene Webb. She started this work as a mom on a mission to protect and heal her own children. Her book is an easy to follow guide to help a loved one through addiction. Her organization is named after her son, Gabriel. Her book is written about her recovered and successful, beautiful daughter, Lindsay. We are so honored um, to have Arlene as a friend of our organization and also that she's willing to share everything that she has learned along her journey. She is a parent with a heart for prevention and a love for people. Um, the title of her book is Parent of an Adult Addict and Hope for the Broken Road. Um, you can find that on Amazon and I hope that you will because it's an amazing book and Arlene has, has poured her heart into that. And if you have a loved one struggling for addiction, she's got a lot of information and hope here for you today. Thank you, Michelle. And Thanks, Arlene. I just want to say thank you for full circle. You know, you did our very oh, first yeah. webinar for us ever, and now you're back again with the powerful presentation yeah. for today. Yes, I love Operation Pair. You guys are great and always putting out great resources and, and for parents and for families. So thank you. Welcome um, back. We love you and appreciate um, you. Thank you. Thank you, Operation Parent. Thank you, Michelle. And I just want to say thank you to all of you who are here today who are going to be just participating as we go through a presentation of navigating the system of addiction and then helping you to understand your treatment options. So as you can see, or as you saw from the previous slide, that I am a nurse and also have a divinity degree and that I'm also a founder of an outreach project called the Gabriel Project 930. Sometimes I call it the DP 930. And um, I'm also um, an independent, Advocate for Casey's Law Incorporated. It's a it's a or a nonprofit organization in in Kentucky that helps family um, petition the court for involuntary treatment. So I work with um, the Casey Law organization um, in Louisville. Uh, they're actually in Northern Kentucky, but I'm the advocate in Jefferson County for them. And I love um, advocating for families and helping them on their journey as they navigate the system and navigate different resources. And also the most recent thing I've been involved with over the last few years is an organization called Citizens Attacking Addiction. I've had various roles with them. I just sat on the board for a while, then I was, you know, coaching families for a while. I still do that. Then I started helping them to develop um, their strategic plan and implementing it. And then I became their interim executive director. Um, for a while. And so it's a great organization that is trying to end the scourge of addiction in Louisville. Um, the other thing that I have done is I've been a professor of anatomy and physiology for a nursing school. And I've also helped to co-found another organization called the Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, I'm not with that organization anymore, but they're a great organization um, in harm reduction. But I have trained different communities and different um, stakeholders across the state of Kentucky in how to administer naloxone, which is a medication that can reduce, um, that can reverse an opioid overdose. So with all that being said, I do, before we get started with the presentation, I do want to give you a little bit of personal history about why I do what I do and why I'm passionate about what I do. I am a mother of four. And all of my children are grown, all four of my children are grown, but three of my adult children have a substance use disorder. And I'm telling you, I did not know how to navigate the system. I didn't know what to do. I moralized it. Um, and anyway, um, I want to share with you a little bit about my daughter, Lindsay. She's the one I wrote the book about. And um, she was found in my basement from an overdose on heroin and the needle was still in her arm when I found her. And being a nurse, I recognized her agonal breathing. A lot of times in the medical field, field you're here, you were here, that's called the gasp of death. And she was literally, you know, gasping her last breath. Um, and she was blue, she was mottled, she was ashen. I had seen, I've seen people pass away and she looked dead. And I initiated CPR anyway. And 
um, just because of her, you know, breathing. And I thought, well, at best, if she lives, she'll be brain dead. And But I'm here to tell you today, she is six years in recovery. And she has a little baby, and she's doing great. And then I have a son, Jacob, who has a substance use disorder. Um, I, I don't know exactly how many times he's overdosed, but I'm thinking it's close to near the eight. And each time he's been reversed with naloxone. And um, anyway, there's a long story with all that, how he got on his way to recovery. I'd love to share that one day. But he is in recovery. He's in five years in recovery. He's in college. And he actually worked for one of the best um, recovery treatment facilities here in Kentucky called Isaiah's House. And he is uh, supervises their peer support program. He's in college. And he is doing wonderful. And then I had my son, Gabriel, oh, the best guy ever. And um, he overdosed first in 2010 in our neighborhood. Um, he was outside with some friends. He overdosed. They left him. They ran. Um, I wasn't home. Somebody found him, took him to the hospital. He was in the hospital with John Doe. He was in a coma. Eight hours later, they find out who his mom, his family is. I go down there. And when I get down there, the doctors tell me, we don't think he's going to live. He's not going to make it. If he is, he's brain dead. So anyway, I get down there and he wakes up. And they discharge us. And I asked them, please help me to get help. And they said, we, you know, we don't do this for heroin. We only admit for alcohol and Xanax. Long story. Anyway, he overdoses again in 2013 in a sober home in a garage. Um, somebody revives him. They move him up to another sober home in Indianapolis. And on April the 8th, he overdoses, and all the friends leave but one. And his friend did CPR. And I'm so grateful for that guy because it gave us four more days with Gabriel before he died in my arms. And um, so it'll be eight years this year since he died. But I'm so grateful. Um, to be able to share with you all these things that I've learned. So, again, getting back to my book, um, it's about my daughter, Lindsay. I do mention Gabriel in there, but it's a resource book for parents. And if you live in Louisville, I'd be glad to get a book to you and sign it. If you live outside of Louisville, outside Kentucky, you can go to Amazon, and it's filled with all kinds of resources. So with that all being said, let's go ahead and get started, guys on uh, the webinar and let's talk about um, our learning objectives what we're going to go through there is so much material that we're going to cover today and i hope it helps you these are things that i've learned the majority of what i um, um will show you here today come from various resources but the majority of it does come for, from the parents um, partnership to end addiction and they just have some fabulous resources and so anyway our first objective we're going to look at is you know help we're going to discuss networking and how to approach others for help. Then we're going to talk about treatment. We're going to define, actually define and explore all those various treatment options that are available. And this is so significant because early on um, when my kids, when I was looking for treatment, I didn't know the difference between a sober home, a halfway house, you know, a recovery house, a recovery home. You know, there uh, I didn't know to look for accreditation. I didn't know what to look for. And um then we're going to talk about coaching. This is a, a, a fairly new concept, at least to me and to some of the people in Kentucky, but we're going to introduce and define this idea of parent addiction coaching and, and family resource coaching, coaching, which is what I do. And then we're going to look at your options. We're going to learn what your next steps you know, are going to be determined, your options for your loved one. And then we're going to provide you with a roadmap that's from the partnership to end addiction. And it's a sample roadmap to your child's treatment roadmap, but it's just not for your child. It can be for anyone in your that you love or a significant other. And then we're going to talk about support. There are going to be a ton of resources provided for you to help you find treatment support for yourself and then also for that person that has a substance use disorder. So um, so how do you find the right treatment? Well, there are six steps that you can look at if you wanted to break this down. Um, and the first one is always to educate yourself. The second one is you're always going to want to get a screening and you're always going to want to have an in-depth professional assessment. And then step three is you're going to learn how to network. Who are those people out there that, that you could actually network with that can help you in this process? And then step number four is a big, big one about understanding the different treatment options and what they mean. And then once you have that assessment and once you understand the treatment options and once you get that recommendation, 
you're for help you're going to be looking at okay so what about location who where are we going to send this loved one and what's the best fit for them and the number six is you're going to decide or decide how to do that by making calls and asking questions so um step one um, educate yourself. You're going to need to educate yourself to understand, first of all, what substance use treatment consists of. You do want to stay open-minded. You don't want to give up during the process. It can be really arduous, um, but your loved one's problem is not going to be solved overnight. So by educating yourself, you are going to actually help your child or your loved one hopefully get their life back on track sooner rather than later. So one of the most important things you can do is to educate yourself about alcohol, educate you about educate yourself about the different drugs, about the dependence, and what treatment for use looks like, and what dependence is. You're going to want to know the signs and the symptoms symptoms of drug use, and knowing what that might look like um, if you have someone that has a substance use disorder, because different drugs are going to have different signs, different symptoms. You know, an opiate's going to be different from meth or cocaine, and Xanax is going to be different from an opiate. Um, and then know your resources that are in your state and in your city. Educate yourself about understanding the addictive brain. I didn't understand the addictive brain. Yeah, I taught anatomy and physiology to nursing students. I didn't teach about the addictive brain, but I moralized um, what that was. And it wasn't Dr. Gabriel died that I sought out. Um, an addiction physician and began to ask questions so I could just understand. And then understand not just the how to get help for your loved one, but how, what about you? What about support for yourself? And then most of all, understanding what those various treatment options are for treatment. So like I said, this is going to be an ongoing process and you're not going to know everything overnight. Okay, so step two is screening and assessment. It's going to be essential that you get a screening a screening and an in-depth assessment for your loved one by a qualified healthcare professional if they are using substances. So the screening and assessment steps. Um, here's how this pretty much works. First, um, you're going to identify and obtain a screening by a professional. And this may be through a mental health resource in your community. It might be, um, you know, through um, your physician someone to recommend where you need to go get a screening at. Um, but the screening is different from an assessment in that the screening just gives you a quick picture of substance use and a possible need for a, an additional evaluation. And when you get the screening, if it's found that there's a, an additional assessment that needs to be done, then you need a professional assessment by a quali qualified healthcare professional, what they're going to do is determine the level of care that your loved one needs. So what, and that could be, um, um, it, that when you have actually the assessment, they're going to look at other things. They're just not going to look at the um, substance use. They're going to look at, you know, what drugs are they using, but they're going to look at what's going on in the family. Do they have another co-occurring disorder? Is there a depression here? Is there some mental health issues? Are there any medical issues? Are there any educational issues? Do they have a learning disability? So this full comprehensive assessment will help that substance use treatment professional determine that level of care. So how do they do this? What do they use? And actually professionals in the field usually refer to ASAM, which is the American Society of Addiction Medicine. They have what they call a patient placement criteria, and these are guidelines to help match individuals to an appropriate level of and type of care that's needed. Now, now there's also another tool that the healthcare professionals will and can use it's called SBRIT, and it involves a, a quick screening, a brief intervention, a referral to treatment. So this quickly accesses the severity of the substance use disorder and identifies the level of care as well. So that's the screening and assessment. Now, when you're talking about step three, how to approach others for help, um, you're going to, number one, you've got to break your silence. You've got to because silence lives in the shame. And number two, you're going to seek out some support for others 
you're going to possibly reach out to your community to find out what's there and maybe, maybe consider this idea of coaching. So when you go to breaking your silence, you want to tell someone that you can trust. You, you might contact an interventionist. You might have one in, in one of the treatment facilities there. You may be involved with, you know, get involved with a support group. What about local counseling? What about local support groups like PAL groups or um, Al-Anon groups? Or what about your addiction centers or those treatment facility providers that are reputable that are in your area? Many of them will offer family support services. And then there are some religious groups that have, um, you know, help with Celebrate Recovery and, you know, helping you to find treatment. Some of those, if you are involved with any type of a faith organization, some of them will help you um, in listening and then helping you to break your silence and getting help for yourself. Well, I will tell you a couple things that I did before um, my kids overdosed on heroin. You know, I didn't share, you know, my experience at first. I wanted to protect them from the stigma because we all know there's stigma that surrounds addiction. And so, um, there was eventually I connected with this group. It was called the Addict Mom, and they had a page, and it was on the internet. So I joined that page, and they used to offer these really cool teleconferences all over the nation. Um, and a lot of those times, they would have an interventionist, uh, a, a professional, on those calls. And as a parent, we could ask them things, and they would kind of coach us and guide us um, through what we were going through. So that was really cool. I'm not so much involved with them anymore, but. Um, Again, you just want to make sure that you break your silence. And, you know, there's different reasons why we remain silent. Mine was probably out of shame. Um, some might be that you don't know what to do. Some people think, well, it's a private issue. Um, we don't need to let the world know what's going on with us. Some of it's guilt. Um, maybe you think you're helping your loved one and you don't have boundaries. Maybe it's just a fear of this judgment by family or friends, whatever it is. You know, find a safe place to be able to share. Um, like I say, one of the most and first, most helpful things I did was reach out to people that were around me that I knew had been walking through this. And so um, you might look at those around you who are going through what you've been through. Maybe they're further along the road um, than you are. But anyway, just understanding, you know, that addiction is a chronic disease and there's nothing a moral failing that's on your part or your child's part. So always just keep in mind that the people that you had your problems from, from Maybe like the same people that you could give good advice to or that could give you good advice or connect you to help that you need. Um, anyway, so let's talk about seeking out help. Um, we talked a little bit about this, about seeking out those people with a similar experiencing and connecting with others who have walked in your shoes. Um, that's going to be really valuable to you. There's just something about relating to someone who has experienced the same thing that you have. Again, I reached out to the addict's mom. It was a great support. I met all kinds of mothers through this group, and it was a lifesaver early on for me. PAL groups, these are parents of addicted loved ones. This, these groups grew out of an organization um, in Arizona. And when I first started joining the groups, I did them on telephone because they only had these groups in Arizona and Indiana at the time that I was on, but now they are spread and they're popping up in different states all across um, the nation. I know in, in Kentucky here, we have maybe about eight, maybe 10 PAL groups across our state, and um, they meet in person. I think they've been meeting on Zoom lately, but anyway, there are several, and so you just have to go to their website and look and see maybe that's an option you might want to look at and find out where the closest meeting is for you. So anyway, and I've also learned a lot through social media and people I've met through um, social media who offered a lot of support. I'm in a lot of groups and in a lot of rooms that, um, that have support for parents. So again, like I say, I went through the parent addiction coach, this guy in Arizona that founded it. He used to take my telephone calls. And um, he would just coach me through whatever I was going through, and I learned a whole lot through him. And so, yeah, so this concept of parent addiction coaching is, is, is beginning to make headway. So the concept here, guys, is to tell somebody that you can trust, even um, if it's family and even if it's friends that don't have experience with a substance use disorder. There are other ways that they can support you. Um, by helping you maybe sort through programs or maybe talk about your fears or maybe talk about 
you know, some of your concerns, or maybe they can just be there for you when you do have to make those difficult decisions. So anyway, just talk to those people around you that you feel that you can trust. So networking is not only going to help you get the help and support you need, but it will help your per the person that you love and help you to feel less alone and to offer you the support that you need. Again, the Addicts Mom, Pal Groups, Al-Anon, there's all kinds of social media um, support groups that you can get involved with and then your family and friends. And then I don't know how many of you all have ever heard about um, um, RCOs, you know, just reaching out to a recovery community organization. A recovery community organization, uh, organization usually involves an organization that's a nonprofit that's set up in communities. And it's really geared and targeting the people that are in recovery, that have been through treatment or they're in recovery and they're working a program of some sort. But a lot of these RCOs, these recovery community organizations, offer family support, family resources. So you might want to check out um, your state or your city and see if maybe you have an RCO. I know in Louisville we have one called LRCC. It's a Louisville Recovery Connect Community Connection. And we have another one, a great one called Young People in Recovery, YPR, and another one called PAR, People Advocating Recovery. And so just look, it's, if you go to Faces and Voices of Recovery, which is a national organization, you should be able to locate whether or not your state or your city has one of these recovery community organizations and whether or not they have one that targets families. That's another really um, great one to, to look and consider. Now, again, when you're talking about um, considering a parent addiction coach or a family resource coach, you... Um, might want to consider doing that like I did. Um, coaching is really, it's not really counseling. It's about connecting you with someone who has maybe been where you are and then and them coaching you in different options or offering support to you wherever or whatever questions you might have. They listen, they offer ideas, they reaffirm that you're not alone in the struggle. And a lot of times it's a peer-to-peer -peer support. And it's as simple as a phone call, a text, or an email, like if you wanted to reach out to the partnership to end addiction, they use, they've trained their volunteers um, in family um, parent addiction coaching using what they call CRAFT, which is a community reinforcement and family training. There's another one out there called Changing Lives Foundation. Now, um, a, a parent addiction coach is a peer to peer support for families. What is a family resource coach? They're familiar with local and state resources. That's something that I do for citizens attacking addiction. I um, am very familiar with um, our state and local resources. So I might have a family call me about what are the different treatment options for their child. They might call me about, um, you know, Casey's Law and how to file Casey's Law. They might call me about resources. They might call me about family recovery support, like Families Anonymous or something like that. They might call me about kinship care resources or grief support or guidance. So anyway, um, also know that with family resource coaching, um, I don't know that there's a specific state or certification for that. This is just something that I began to do. But I do know with parent addiction coaching, there are different um, places like with craft and stuff where they, you know, you could become certified. So again, what it's not though, remember, is counseling. You don't have to be a counselor to be a coach, but yet there are some coaches that are counselors. Again, how do you find a coach? Um, the Partnership to End Addiction is one. Lifehouse Network is another. Um, the Changing Lives Foundation is another one. Some of these will help you create a plan. Sometimes in some of the PAL groups, the parents of addicted loved ones, they will have people that are coaches in their support groups. And sometimes through your state or local resources to look at. So I will tell you that um, recently I just came across some other really good resources and they're not in, included in the end of the presentation, but Nikki will send these to you in a follow-up email. There are some different ways where if you wanted to be a craft trained volunteer, how you can do that. And um, there are some other centers like the Center for Motivation and Change that um, allies in recovery. Some of these have web-based memberships 
and learning modules and teach you about the craft um, um, model and then how you can in, in, implement this with families. There's another one called Regain Your Hope. There's another one. There's a really cool podcast called Family Addiction Coaching, and it's with a guy called Patrick Doyle. He does a free podcast, and you can listen to that. He's a social worker, but he's also trained in the craft model, and he does parent coaching and addiction coaching. So those are just some of the um, the other resources for you and, and the description for that. Now, when you look at steps four, understanding the different options and what they mean, I think before we go into this, we're going to have a poll that the audience can participate in. So, Nikki, I'm going to hand this over to you. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to uh, launch this poll and um, you'll have about 30 seconds. Uh, you'll have about 30 seconds to answer the poll. Um, but here we go. The question is true or false. A sober home and a halfway house are the same thing. So again, I'll give you a little bit of time to do that. And uh, after I give you guys the answer here in a couple seconds, Arlene is going to uh, do us the honor of explaining more about that. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Okay, so it looks like two of you uh, said that the true and 98% of you said false. Uh, the overwhelming majority of you got that right. It is false. And Arlene, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, I will be happy to as we go on, as we move on to the treatment options. Now, the next couple of things that you're going to see is actually um, a chart on the next two slides. And um, what we're going to do is talk about the, the different treatment options, what they need, to need, describe them, look at their length, and look at the uh, intensity and maybe some things that you should know. Now, we don't get to sober homes till the next slide, but we can go ahead and go to that slide as I go over it and just let you see the difference and then Nick if you don't mind we'll go back to the first the other slide in just a minute but when you go down on the on the chart you see sober homes and then you see halfway houses um, the description of a sober home is an alcohol and drug-free living environment and that's for people wanting to maintain sobriety and most of those homes will mandate or strongly encourage attendance of 12-step meetings you know in these homes you, you know you might stay there for three months you might stay there for 12 months usually Pray, pay privately, and usually it's a week-to-week -week payment, um, and that cost varies, you know, um, depending where you are. But it's not treatment; it's not covered by insurance. It's private pay. And then when you look at the halfway houses, how that's different from the sober home. And a lot of you may know this. It looks like a lot of you already knew this, but the term refers to a transitional home between incarceration and freedom, regardless of whether or not you use drugs. And that's usually three to twelve months too. It's not treatment. It's usually run by the Department of Corrections. So there are, however, some individuals that have a substance use disorder that do live in halfway houses. So that's the difference. Sober homes and halfway houses are not the same. Um, one is usually a trans transitional home between incarceration. So let's go back to the other, the first chart, and let's talk about a couple of things here. I know it really looks busy, but um, this is the, this is um, something that I didn't know the difference between when I started out with my children, with Gabriel and with Jake and with Lindsay. I didn't understand that detox wasn't recovery. I thought once they detox it, okay, get a job, you know, get back to your job, get back to your life. But what I didn't realize that recovery is a lifelong effort. This is something that you have to do every single day to maintain your recovery and to sustain recovery is it's the detox itself is the easy part. Um, recovery is a lifelong effort. So what is detox? So that's the process of where of removing the drugs from your body. So in the case of substance use, it specifically refers to this period of time that a body is allowed to process or to metabolize any drug or alcohol in the system. And in doing, doing so, it clears that toxic influence out of their system. It can, the detox can be painful. It can be dangerous. That's why um, medical detox um, is very important. Detox with medical supervision allows the patient to detox in a safe and a comfortable envi environment with help medically. 
and one of the biggest fears of someone who's been on opioids especially is detox because you feel like you've had the flu 10 times over. Now, some people believe in the cold turkey method. You know, some people have done that. And um, my kids have done that in numerous times, you know, just detox cold turkey. But if you have a loved one that has alcohol or Xanax um, use, you know, use where they need to detox, you have to be really careful because you can die from that. And those people absolutely need to be medically assisted with their detox because you can actually die from that. Now, um, stabilization centers, these are community-based short-term residential treatment units. They're, they provide immediate care to individuals that may be in a mental health or a substance use crisis. So when you go into a stabilization center, they might, it's going to be less than 24 hours. Um, but this is going to vary state to state. Um, some people have what they call the living room model or a crisis center. And really what it is, it diverts people away from the hospitals. Um, um, like I say, some of them are like home-like environments. They address behavioral um, health crisis. Or, um, it's, but they can also be like in a hospital setting. Some of them will have maybe six to 16 beds. They might be staffed by licensed or unlicensed peer support, as well as clinical and non-clinical professionals that hold degrees like master or bachelor's degrees. Um, some of their services might consist of an assessment, a diagnosis, an abbreviated treatment plan, observation, case management, or individual group counseling. Um, they might prescribe or monitor psychotropic meds, um, give them referrals, give them linkage to services. So again, the delivery is offered on a 24-hour basis to address clients' immediate safety needs and develop a, resist, a resilient and a creative plan. So again, it's to divert um, a psychiatric hospitalization. So on the next three, um, outpatient, intensive outpatient, partial hospitalization. All three of these is where the client lives at home but they attend a treatment program at the facility. And how they are different is how many hours a week that they spend um, in the treatment, in treatment and receiving outpatient treatment. Like you can see from the stabilization centers, it's, it's usually less than 24 hours in a week. Um, it uh, is, you know, it's sometimes nine hours a week, some of it. It might include medicated assisted treatment but you need to be sure in each of these that you ask about, well, what happens after I'm out of outpatient, after my insurance runs out? What about aftercare? What about a continuum of care? And when you look at intensive outpatient, uh, you'll hear a lot of people call this IOP, and that's where you have nine hours a week or more. It might be two to three times a week or two or more hours a day at a time. So a lot of the length of this depends on their progress, their goals, and the plan. And with hospitalization, it's going to be much more intense. It's going to be at least 20 hours or more per week. And it's going to, again, depend on the progress and the go. So it's intensive, it's structured, and it's appropriate for those that do have a co-occurring disorder, like a mental health diagnosis. So again, in all these, you do want to ask about support and care after the program is over. And then you have your residential recovery. Um, this is where the patient lives and receives services on site, including counseling, recovery coaching, mental health treatment, medication management if needed. This can vary depending on your insurance um, from 12 days, 5 days to 30 days. It really is going to depend on your insurance. Any more insurance doesn't want to pay much more than 30 days inpatient. But there's a lot of the programs out there, like the one that my son Jacob went to, it was an 11-month program. Um, but they can be up to 12 to 18 months. It's high intensity. The length is going to vary again. And so you need to be sure that if you're looking at a residential recovery rehab, ask about the phases. Ask about case management. Ask about legal assistance, counseling, nurses, doctors. Ask about aftercare. Ask if they do Medicaid-assisted treatment. These are all the things that you're going to look for. And I included the dual diagnosis underneath this because this, as some of you might not know what I mean by this, all, as some of you will, but this is where you have both a mental disorder and a substance use disorder, but not all 
So what you need to know about this is that not all treatment and recovery homes offer dual diagnosis. So um, if that's something that's important to you and for your loved one, whether it's your teenager, your adult child, your husband, your wife, your significant other, is there, you know, that's the question you're going to ask. Do you all treat co-occurring disorders or dual diagnosis? That's a big one. And going on to the next one on the treatment option chart, um, we're going to look at medicated assisted treatment. And what is that? This is usually for individuals with a physical dependency upon certain substances. Usually it's primarily opioids like heroin, fentanyl, oxycontin, oxycodones, those things, Vicodins. Medication is provided in a specialized either outpatient or inpatient setting in combination with the counseling and other treatment services that the, the person, your loved one will get. So the link depends. Some people stay in it for a long time. Some only have to be on it temporarily. But just so you know that there are different medications like Vivitrol is usually um, a once a month shot. Then there's a pill form of Vivitrol called naltrexone. And then there's Suboxone. You can take Subutex, Sublic A pills. Um, some of these are sublingual methadone. Um, again, MAT is for opioids, not meth, not Xanax, not cocaine. So some homes will, you know, allow medicated assisted treatments. Some homes won't. So you just need to know whether or not the place you picked out will do that. So um, let's look at, <coughs> we've already talked about sober homes, um, not treatment. I did want to tell you something about the sober home, though, and you'll see in the notes on the side what you should know. Then there are some universities that have sober domes, have sober dorms, excuse me. You just need, like if you're, you have a, a young adult in your family that's had an issue with substance use, you can um, ask the university that they're going to whether or not they have sober dorms. And then there are also some recovery high schools across the states, um, in some states, um, and I don't know particularly which ones have them. I just know that they're out there, but there is a resource if you want to know about a recovery high school for a teenager or a university for a young adult that has sober dorms, you can go to recoveryschools.org and visit that, and you can get a list of those. We already talked about halfway houses. I don't know how many of you all have heard about Oxford homes. They're actually sober homes, and they're self-run. They're self-supported. And the recovery houses that are across the United States, and and um, the length of time is usually one to five years that you can stay. It's not treatment; it's private pay. You usually have a house manager that's someone in in um, recovery. Some of the houses have six people. You can have up to sixteen that are living together in a home. But it does have a really strict structure. But I do know that there are about twenty four hundred self sustaining sober homes that utilize the Oxford House model across the United States. So that, there's that. And then there's faith-based centers, and I include these because there are some people that do want to uh, incorporate their faith and their beliefs with their recovery. So um, usually a, a faith-based center is spiritual or gospel-centered. They have a gospel-centered approach. Um, a lot of times it's a discipleship program and they disciple residents in their faith as well as a, they're giving them um, help in their recovery for the practicality of their substance use disorder. Um, there are some that are 30 days or some that are a year. That are, there are many that are licensed and credentialed. I know we have some very good ones in the state of Kentucky that hold some of the, um, the gold seal licensing and the credentialing, but they're also, also um, gospel-centered. Um, I will just as a word of caution, what you should know, that you do need to be a little bit leery of those faith-based sober homes or facilities um, that are not accredited or credentialed in any way. What you're going to want to do is visit them. You're going to want to ask about their philosophy. What do they do for discipline? What does their structure day look like? How are they helping this person in recovery? And I only say that because I had a really bad experience with a place that I had sent Gabriel to. And because it said they were faith-based, I sent it to him there and didn't visit it, didn't ask about their philosophy, only to my horror, you know, going to get him one day to help him find a job. 
It was infested with bed bugs, mice, rats. It was a flop house and it was terrible. So always visit those places. Another one, um, treatment options you have, you have, we can't leave out the expectant mothers. These are women that are pregnant that also have a um, substance use disorder and their length of time for their treatment is going to vary. Some of these places are outpatient, but there are some that are residential as well. I know in Kentucky, we have some really good uh, residential places. There's a place called Karen's Place. There's a place called Chrysalis House. There's Volunteers of America that, um, anyway, just know that um, there are homes specifically targeting expectant mothers to help them with through their pregnancy and then through their recovery after the child is born. I also included a social model for recovery. Kentucky has, um, I think they are at 18 now for social model recovery um, homes. And these are free homes that are in Kentucky. And so you may have one in your state or two or whatever, but these are peer-to-peer -peer structured and they are usually up to two years and they're residential. But many of them are not licensed or accredited or structured. They do, I mean, they do have structure and it's peer-to-peer -peer support and it's abstinence-based. So they don't normally, some of these do not take Medicaid-assisted treatment. Some of them might take Vivitrol. Um, some of them um, sometimes will not allow psychotropic medications. So you might want to ask those questions. You know, they have worked really well and gotten many, many people on their road to recovery. Um, but then you have to make sure that that's going to be a fit for your loved one. Okay, so that's it for the treatment options. Um, hope you review those again, you know, in your spare time. I know that was rushed. So step number five, when we're talking about location. Now, once you've discussed the results of the screening and assessment with the treatment professional and you've determined the type of services, that's going to be helpful for your loved one. You're, you should start looking for programs or recovery homes or residential recovery or whatever they recommended. Maybe it's outpatient in your area that meet your requirements and meet the um, determined level of care. Um, location is going to be an important factor when it comes to the study on a treatment program for your child. So what exactly do you want to consider? That's what you need to ask yourself. What do you want to consider when you're choosing a location? Uh, what about quality and level of care? What about their philosophy? What about their structure? What about their licensing? What about their credentials? What are your requirements going to be? Is family involvement important to you? And family support in recovery is a big aspect of that person's recovery, having that support that they need. Um, are you going to look outside your area that's going to be more conducive? It could be that the the, the qualified healthcare professional that that you took your loved one to, maybe they recommended a certain level of care and they recommend that you come to their facility and that might be a fit for you, it might not be a fit. So just keep your options open um, about and looking at other programs. So, you know, you have to remember that the closer the treatment program is to your home or to your work or community, um, it's gonna be easier for the entire family to participate in that treatment and that recovery. So, but with that being said, I will have to tell you when my son Jacob went to a recovery house, when he went to Isaiah's house, he was over an hour away, but uh, my husband and I had wanted him outside of Louisville when he agreed to go get help. We didn't have to Casey law him or anything, but he wanted help. And, um, and he even tells me even now to this day on several occasions, if you would have chosen a place in Louisville in the city that we're at, I would have walked out. So that decision is going to be different for each family member. They can still walk out even if they're um, an hour away, but he was less likely to do so and he stuck with it for those 11 months. So it also could be that maybe you don't live in an area um, that doesn't have a level of care that your child needs. This could require your loved one that's participating in a program such as inpatient or residential treatment. Um, they could be several hours away from your home. So even if they're in another state. So in this case, you just wanna make sure that you discuss with wherever you choose how the family is involved. You can do this, through, is it gonna be through phone calls, emails, family visits? How are they gonna relay that information to you and how is the family gonna be involved in the recovery? So, um, post six, I mean, but not post six, but um, step six, we're gonna make calls and ask questions, but we're gonna do another poll here. And Nikki, I'm gonna hand that over to you. Hello again, everybody. 
Uh, for poll number two, again, you'll have 30 seconds to answer it. I'm going to launch it right now. The poll is true or false. All treatment programs, including sober and halfway houses, must be licensed and accredited through the state. Can I see your all responses coming in? Give you a couple more seconds. Then Arlene will take us through the answer. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. It looks like 41% said true and 59% said false. So a little more split on this one. Uh, Arlene, would you like to take us through that answer? Yes, yes, I would love to take you through that answer. Now, um, when you're talking about all treatment programs and including sober houses and halfway houses, um, not all of them, this is false actually, um, not all, recovery programs, including sober houses and halfway houses, have to be licensed or accredited through the state. It's gonna depend on um, your state, um, whether or not what their credential, what, what their accreditations are. You can open, anybody can open up a sober home in the state of Kentucky and you don't have to, you know, have a license for it and you don't have to um, be accredited for that. Now, I will tell you that there is a list of states that with sober home accreditation statuses, and we're going to send you this as well. It's through the Mental Health Addiction Certification Board. And there's there's also another one called NAR, N-A-R-R, -R, National Association of Recovery Residencies. Um, they oversee actually 23 regional offices, including um, one in Florida called FAR. But it's a nonprofit organization that helps set standards um, through the MHACBO, which is the Mental Health Addiction Certification Board. Um, and they see states with current accreditations or proposed accreditation. So there are several states. It's a really good website to go to to look and see if your state, you know, has an accreditation for sober homes and what their standards of care are, or if there's any legislation um, that shows that they that um, sober homes have to be accredited. Um, like I say, a lot of them um, will have a set of standards, but they're not mandatory. Um, to, to join or to be accredited for those recovery residences. There are um, people like in Florida, that Alliance, uh, Florida Alliance for Recovery Residencies, they offer certifications for sober homes to receive a certification, but it's not mandatory like they say. Um, and a lot of states do not require them to, uh, sober homes to be licensed under the state law. And of course, there's a National Association of Recovery Residences, again, called NAR. Now, you can also use SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse Mental Health um, or, um, Association organization. Um, they have suggested guidelines for best practices for sober homes. So just a note that, um, that that's not a resource in your handout, but we will send that resource to you if you're interested in knowing what your state and what, what, how they progress and if sober homes are licensed or accredited in any way. So with that being said, we'll move on to step six about making calls and asking questions. So just a note, there's a handout for you. Um, it, you can see on the side of your screen where they are um, on making calls and asking those questions because you cannot be sure if a, the program is, best, uh, is the best fit for your loved one unless you talk to the people that at, at that program and ask those questions. Yeah, this is going to be time consuming, but it's going to be worth it because the most important thing that you can do to help your loved one is to ask those treatment programs and providers these valuable questions so you can truly understand how their approach works. You, there's no such thing as asking too many questions when you're selecting a provider that's going to have the care of your loved one there. So what do you ask? What do you know what to ask? And compare those answers. So, you know, what, you know, knowing what to ask and then comparing those answers from those different programs will help you determine which program that you maybe feel like that you should try and help with your loved one. And so you just don't want to make the mistake of going somewhere that offers, hey, we'll give you, fly, fly your loved one here for free. And you don't want to get caught in a shuffle where they're really just looking at getting your money and, and you know, 
that might not be a good fit for that person. It might be a really reputable organization, but use your consumer educational skills that you would use with any serious healthcare decision. Trust your judgment and your feelings about the answers that you get from the people that you talk to. You know, again, there's a handout on some of those questions that you can ask. Um, and you, it's a worksheet, actually, is what it is. And, you, and as you make those phone calls, I mean, is it important to you that they're licensed? Is it important to you that ha they have what they call CARF accreditation? You know, what's the staff to client ratio? What's the background and the education of the staff? I mean, is the facility clean? Is it organized? Is it well run? You know, um, dual diagnosis? Do they take MAT? I mean, so those are some of the questions that you're going to ask. So, Again, when you're looking at licensed versus non-licensed, there are some accreditations that have a gold seal. One of those is CARP. It's the Commission on Accreditation of Rehab Services. So when you're looking for treatment and the credentials and the facilities, um, some of them will have CARP. Some of them might have Joint Commission. That's not ONC up there, but it's called JCO, um, AODE, Alcohol and Other Drug Entity. Um, behavioral health services organizations. So again, when you're looking for treatment, look and ask about their credentials, um, what services they offer, their length, their phases, their philosophy, aftercare, continuum of care. And because if they have these credentials, there are certain criteria that that recovery facility and treatment facility has to meet to stay licensed or certified and have that seal of CARF or have that AOD, you know, the AODE or the Behavioral Health and Services Organization. So do they have that license and credentialed staff to provide those services? So is that something that's important to you? Yeah, I know it's important to me, but so just ask about their services and ask about their licensing and credentials. Now, we're hitting the home stretch here. We're gonna talk about a treatment road roadmap in one of your handouts you're going to see there is a treatment roadmap. And this again is the partnership to end addiction. This is a great algorithm to follow to get the road to recovery um, for your, your loved ones because the road to recovery isn't the same for everybody. So you're gonna be asking these questions to yourself. So there's a lot of options to consider um, when you're going through this. This guide, the, this guide outlines these key steps um, to help you make an informed choice for your loved one, which may come in the form, it might come in the form of formal treatment. So again, um, on that next slide, when you're looking at the treatment roadmap, um, it's, it's a roadmap, it's an algorithm. So it's a step-by-step -step guide with a series of questions that is going to guide you through the process as you make those decisions. Um, so you want to make sure, you know, as you're going through this, you know, you're going to more likely get the right treatment for your child, for your, your loved one or for your ch child. And this process, and this is how you're going to navigate this system, is by carefully examining these questions and determining, um, you know, what those answers are that will take you on to the next. Let's say that you say, have you talked to your child? You'll answer yes or no. So whether you answer yes, it will take you to another question. And whether you answered, oh, that will take you to another question. Do you see how that's working? So are they getting, are they open to that loved one that you have? Are they open to getting help? Yes, they are. Or no, they're not. If they're not, then it tells you what to do. And if they are, then it tells you the next step in doing that. So you're going to explore your options. And it's going to guide you through that process as you do that. So, and you just want to really, again, make sure that when you're navigating the system, um, that you're really, really careful because if you've ever searched online for help um, or treatment for your loved one, you might have come across an advertisement for free treatment free, free treatment referral services. Um, these services are a lot of times affiliated with private for-profit treatment providers. Um, those providers might indeed be really, really reputable, but it's going to be important that you're well informed before engaging with a service that could possibly, and I say possibly, um, put someone's bottom line above the best interest of your family. So anyway, again, um, you can also use, there's a great resource on SAMHSA, the Substance um, Abuse Mental Health. Um, website and ASAM's website and Psychology Today. Those can all help you find a provider. They have directories. 
And then now we're at the end here, guys. Uh, I've used a lot of resources from NIDA. Uh, I use some resources from my book, Partnership to End Addiction, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Um, and here's a slide just on family resources. Um, these are all great resources, guys. Um, um, just go through those and use what you can and don't worry about the others if you can't use them. Treatment locators um, and coaching resources. So there's all kinds of resources there for you as well. Um, there is going to be another one that we're going to add to the resources for coaching. It's going to be, you know, how to find craft coaching around the country. And we'll send you that link to that as well. So with that being said, Michelle, Nikki, I am done with the presentation and we can now look at what questions you guys have. While everyone takes a minute, if you have a question that you haven't put in the queue yet, um, feel free to go ahead and do that now. And I'll go through, we've got just a couple to give you a, a minute, Arlene, we've got a couple of Operation Parent slides I'll go through. And, okay, um, sure. Absolutely. I've got some questions ready for you as well. Okay, all right. All right, so we'll just um, remind you that you can always register for our next monthly webinars at operationparent.org. Um, you can register in advance and then listen at your convenience. Our eighth edition parent handbook is now available. Um, we've got a special offer code there for those of you that have attended. So if you enter 20 off in today's date um, in the in the queue, so in the product resources area at operationparent.org or the shop, um, enter that discount code. You have until March the 5th to do that and you would um, get 20% off of the $11.99 price for our middle and high school handbook. We also have just a few of our seventh edition handbooks left, middle and high school parent handbooks, English and Christian edition, and those are uh, $5.99 each and available up in the shop as well. Continue to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, we'd love to connect with you there, and we continue to put good information out there each day as well. All right. Um, so, Arlene, our first question for you today is, what is the difference of someone having an addiction versus a substance use disorder? I'm sorry, I'm writing these down so I can. No, you're um, good, and I'm uh, happy to repeat it for you too. Well, actually, you know, it all has to do with the terminology. Um, you can have somebody that has an addiction, and a lot of times they'll um, mean the same thing. What is different, like there is a difference between dependence upon a substance and addiction or substance use disorder, because there are actually people that can become physically dependent upon a substance but not be addicted so addiction happens whenever um, you keep doing the same thing over and over and you're using because your brain is still telling you I need that drug you know um, physical dependence can happen like let's say if you have um, for example you've had um, uh, knee surgery or hip surgery or something and you were put on a pain pill an opioid and you become dependent on it and you notice that whenever you come off of it you start to sweat that's a physical dependence or you began to have you know shakes or you began to feel sick that can be a physical dependence a substance use disorder is when the inside of your brain is infected and those receptors and the dopamine and all that 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 cycle is being even when you stop i need that i need that i need that and that's your survival you know um so your brain so reprograms yeah that's a great answer yeah. your brain's basically yeah, reprograms. you still want that dopamine um release and you're not getting it makes sense yeah thank you arlene um we had a couple of folks just mentioned some resources out there they wanted to let the group know about okay. one is um and you probably have heard of these families anonymous uh, for family oh, yes. support here in Louisville yeah. Kentucky and then yeah. we had another attendee mention um, San Diego County has a wonderful system of state accredited treatment centers that are county funded mm -hmm. 
um, at okay. very little cost. Oh, good. So that's uh -huh. awesome yeah. to know about. Yeah. And other um, states may have a similar setup, awesome. which would be yeah. so good. Yeah. Um, and again, you can go back to that resource regarding um, licensing and accreditation for, with the mental health board certification that we'll send later. We'll add that. Um, so they, you can look at your state and see where they are in that process. And I will tell you with Families Anonymous, that is at the end of our resources. Families Anonymous is listed as one of the resources. So yeah, shout awesome. out to Families Anonymous. Yay. <laughs> Great group of people. Very Great good. Group of people. And then um, another attendee wanted you to mention or repeat a little bit of the information on the peer support groups. Um, you mean like through for someone in recovery or for families that need peer-to-peer -peer support. I guess I need that clarified because um, there are peer support groups like there's parents of addicted loved ones. Um, that is a group that is peer support, like family to family support. There's gotcha. Families Anonymous. Is that what yes. they're wanting? That's a, um, we'll have them clarify. Anonymous. They can clarify okay. for us in the chat. Um, yeah, peer to peer support. Now, if you're talking about peer to peer support with coaching, now that's a little bit different than peer to peer support with recovery support for families. I hope that makes sense. Okay, awesome. And if we need to clarify, um, we will. Okay. So, should our addicted loved ones agree to a contract for living with other family members? They must live it up to their end of the agreement or they can't live with that particular family member. So well, you, I do you know, I, I can't say yes. I, I can't say yes or no because it's going to be, a, that's going to be a philosophy that's going to vary from family to family. And so, yeah, there are a lot of people that do contracts, like a lot of in the power groups, they have contracts. Um, I'm not for sure about families anonymous. Um, I all anon, you don't have those contracts. You're there for your own serenity. So it's going to depend upon um, your philosophical belief. I can't tell somebody, you need to make a contract. You know, I can't say, you need to stop doing this. Um, I mean, that's gonna be something that you would want to work with, with maybe a parent addiction coach or with um, a, a support group, like if they do contract. There are some out there, and I do know that in PAL support groups, there are some uh, examples of contracts that you can have with your loved one. but. Personally, I can't tell somebody to do that or not to do it. I didn't do it with my kids. And my two kids are in recovery. I didn't do it with Gabriel. He died. So was that because I didn't have a contract? I don't know. I could have done a lot of things different. So I can't really say, yes, you should or no, you shouldn't. I say you do what you can live with. You do Perfect. what you can live with. Yep. Hard decisions along the way, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so and, you, and let me say something else to that too. You're the sure. one who decides what those boundaries are. You know, um, I know I know a lot of people talk about enabling. I don't like to use that word. I'd rather use boundaries. And you have to decide as as you're the one that either your loved one's living with you, what is that boundary going to be? And make sure that that's clearly communicated because there is a way that you can still support that loved one but still have a clear boundary of what is acceptable and what's not. Yeah, having those boundaries and letting them know. I, I did write Gabriel and Lindsay at Jake one time. Um, we sat, my husband and I sat them down and we had a list of all the treatment facilities and sober homes they could go to, but we also had a list of things that we would not do for them. We would not give them money. We will not do this, but we will help you find help. We want, let us help you find help. So, yeah, so. Perfect, perfect. Um, another attendee is just asking, um, why can't we just have the person that needs to recover stay in to get better? So it sounds like maybe this is someone who doesn't want to do um, stay in recovery. And, you know, I think they're just um, just saying like this, this is a tough road and they really maybe want their family member to stay. At a okay, I guess I'm I'm a little confused. Are they saying they, they want them to stay in recovery to get better, but that person in recovery is wanting to walk away from a treatment facility? That's the way I'm reading it. Yeah, the question okay. is, is pretty that's short, it. but that's what I took away from okay. it. Okay, if, if that's what it is, if um, I will tell you, it's it's common for someone who goes to a treatment facility, recovery facility, after a few days to want to walk away. 
because it's hard. But those first hundred days are hard. And I do, um, sometimes I've had families call me and say, my son is calling me. He's telling me that he's not getting any food and it's so cold there and it's infested with bed bugs. And I'll know the facility particularly, and I know they're clean as a whistle. And I'll say, and here, they're begging him. He's begging them, please come get me. They're not good here. It's horrible here when actually it's a manipulation. So you have to, you know, I, I, I had an incident that happened like that with um, a mother that called me and her son had called her and I told her, I said, do not go get him. Do not. And she was having a hard time. And um, what ended up happening, this young man went to my son and said, quit telling your mother how great it is here. I'm trying to get my mom to come and get me, you know, so you have to kind of be able to distinguish between guilt statements, manipulation, and do they really need to come home? Um, my thing is leave them be, you know, as long as they're getting the care and they're fed and they're being treated right and they're getting the help they need. It's not always great to go and get them because you're just going to be back in that same cycle. Let the program work. That's awesome. Awesome advice. I hope that helps. I sure. hope that helps. Uh, yes. Um, okay. So we have another resource out of South Carolina. Um, okay. It's they said it's very excellent for adolescent focused recovery. Um, called the Courage Center South Carolina .org. Okay. So for those of you that are um, and we do have some folks here from South Carolina today. So we yeah. appreciate that. And then let me see. So is that an inpatient? Is that inpatient or is that you say it's a the Courage Center, but is it an, is it treatment? Is it? Um, I have. Um, we'll just have to look it up, won't we? Yes, we'll and we have. Um, this person has <laughs> Thank you for that resource. provided the website. So for anybody okay. else curious, um, it's www.couragecentersc.org. Okay. okay, we will look that up. Thank we'll you for that resource. Up. Yeah, we appreciate it. And then I'm just yeah. going to peek in here and see if I could get one more question for you, Arlene. Okay. Um, we've got tons of thank yous. So many oh, thank, thank yous. You so many. Um, sorry about the audio. You couldn't hear me. I was just yapping away. <laughs> so sorry about that glitch. Thank you. Oh, it's thank great. You know, I'm so um, impressed with the number of, of you all that have stayed with us. So thank you for yes. sticking it out and and um, letting us work through that. Okay, so um, this person's statement is, I feel without appropriate boundary support. The significant other's behavior rarely changes, um, thus not allowing the addict to experience the pain of their choices. Do you find mm -hmm. that? maybe be the case or now say it again let me let me sure. process this um, through. okay without appropriate you you kind of touched on this already but i think they're just re reaffirming what you said okay without appropriate boundary support the, the significant other's behavior rarely changes thus not allowing oh, yes. them to feel the pain of their choices yeah that, i would say um i don't know if they're asking me if that's true or false or what but you do have to have boundaries because if not it's going to be unhealthy and knowing what those boundaries are so um that behavior is not going to change if you continue not to have those boundaries and what does that boundary i mean um some people say well should i let my loved one stay should i let them live with me what should i kick them out i mean that's something you have to work through and if you don't um have those boundaries like they say yes it's still not going to help um, in that behavior and that change of behavior. Now, I will say this. This is just my personal philosophy. Um, with heroin and with opioids and how quickly they can kill, I don't necessarily believe in rock bottom. Um, it, it, I don't think it fits the scenario with the, the heroin and how quickly it kills. Um, I believe we can raise that bottom up. And that's with our boundaries that we have for them. And always, yes. can, always, I will tell you something. I always tell people when I get calls, I always tell them to say, be prepared in what you're going to say to that loved one. Um, I had an interventionist actually help me through that. And um, it was, Gabriel called me maybe 40 times in one night, this one night. And he said, just be prepared on what you're going to say. And so I would say this to him. I would get, I would get past the guilt and that he was trying to lay on me and the shame he, and he was trying to guilt me. And I would say, Gabriel, I love you. 
will you let me get you help? No matter what else he said to me, I always came back to that. And he'd hang up because he'd be asking for money or something. I would, and so I would say that to you. Be prepared in what you're going to say. You have to divide your emotions um, from that. And I would just say, Gabriel, I love you. Will you help? Let me help you get help. And that's it. You know. Yeah, you're such a good mom. <laughs> ah, He's a great dad. Such a good guy. And, um, and somebody else says um, to you, Arlene, I'm proud yeah. of you and ah. the back and the boundaries that you set and the courage and your convictions and your beliefs. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so you want me to look for one more question real quick? Got... If you want, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yes, here it is. What advice can you give to a mom whose adult son does not want treatment? I would say you still love him. Treatment. For 20 I would years. Say, yeah, I would say stay close and still let him. You might be the only reality that he knows. I mean, you have to be really careful, especially if they're using meth where they can become violent. Your your safety your safety is first. If if they're threatening you or themselves or anything like that, um, I would say stay close to them and still have that rapport with them. It's really heartbreaking to watch that now. Um, the other thing is there's a tool in the toolbox you might be able to use if you're in Kentucky or Ohio, um, and that's Casey's Law, where you can sub, um, petition the court for involuntary treatment. But um, there's a process and a procedure that you have to follow through with that. Not every state has that. Casey's Law is only in Kentucky and Ohio, but other states have involuntary commitment laws. And I always tell people to use that only as a last resort if they're going to be a harm to themselves or to others. Um, yeah, you know, so I would just say stay close. And I mean, I used to go driving looking for Gabriel where I knew, you know, he would get his drugs just to see him, make sure he was okay. And um, I would just say, hey, you know, Gabriel, I was just checking on you. And I found him one time downtown and he was walking. He jumped in my car. He's like, what are you doing down here, mom? And I was like, I was just thinking about you. And I just want to see if I could find you and see your face and tell you I love you. And so, you know, um, there's not much you can do if somebody doesn't want help and they walk away um, unless you have uh, even with the involuntary commitment all oh, there's still not a guarantee there's not this magic dust that you can sprinkle over this and make this go away it's just not and i just say you stay close as you can and still love them and still have those boundaries yeah and it's not and get help for yourself get help and yes. support for yourself yes yeah through families anonymous or pal or a group yeah get help for yourself get that support that you need so much support because it's not the same for everyone and it's not not usually not usually but everyone's experience like one treatment mm -hmm. program might not do it so yeah. the the tenure for families of dealing through the issue it, it's really um heavy i'm sh i know well i will tell you that sometimes it does take more than one time it's just like you're not just going to send them programs they're going to automatically be great after they get out of the program because it's not the program i mean a part of it is that but it's uh, like with jacob he went through 11 months he decided not to live in sober housing went on three months later he's worse off than he was before and he went back i mean he was a mess he was worse off than he was before you know but eventually he found his way um same with my daughter Lindsay. i, I guess she was been in maybe eight or nine different facilities sober homes you know different places found she found her way so, um, yeah, you just, yeah. I feel for you guys out there that experience this. This is really a difficult um, journey for, for families. It's very difficult. I know how um, close you are to Jacob and Lindsay. Mm -hmm. Did they share with you what what made a difference, That what you did for them that made a difference in their recovery? Well, some of it, um, and I want to share about Gabriel as well. Gabriel had written and I found Gabriel's journal after he died and um, he was on one of his steps and you know doing inventory and one of his uh, he was mad at me and I was the first person on his list I thought oh, I had a great relationship with him why is he mad at me you know and I felt so bad to hear he was he passed away and I'm like oh my gosh was I a horrible mother what happened and when I read what he wrote what he wrote was I'm angry with my mom because I can't manipulate her anymore because she's educating herself. And I'm mad because now 
she's teaching my dad, you know, about boundaries. <laughs> so anyway, and, but with Jacob and um, Lindsay, I think the big thing that probably impacted them was Gabriel's death. You know, that, yeah, I think that probably had an, a great impact in them. I do remember Jake saying, because he overdosed the, the very, just a few days after Gabriel, we buried Gabriel, we had Gabriel's service, and and Jake said, you know, Mom, you would think that after Gabriel's death that I wouldn't do this anymore. And he, but he did, but that was a motivating factor. And I think his relationship with God, I have to, I just have to tell you, we're a family um, that believes in God. And, and um, he said, that was what was lacking more than anything in my recovery was that the relationship with God. And so, yeah, they each tell me um, Gabriel's death had a great impact on their recovery. Mm-hmm. And I know you were a pillar, a strong uh, pillar in their recovery too. I don't know. There were times I was just like, I think I'd make it through the next minute. I'm telling you. <laughs> but God is still good. He really is. Yeah. And we're so grateful for you and your time and willingness to share and be with us this afternoon. Um, thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you. Thank you, Operation Parent. Thank you all for being here. And um, yeah, shoot me any questions if you want to. Absolutely. I know we'll have um, we'll have some follow up questions for you, Arlene. <laughs> and we just want to thank everyone for spending the afternoon with us. And we'll look forward um, to seeing you again next time. Thanks so you got much. four minutes to spare. <laughs> it's almost four minutes before 3.30. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Arlene. Uh-huh. Take care, everybody. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Good afternoon. Bye-bye.